Hello there. Hi, uh, my name is Todd Parker, and this is a Let's Play of Salt and Sanctuary. I'm Fletcher. I'm the guy who talked first. We're at the character creation screen here. Uh, I'll be naming my character Rydia for purposes of this playthrough, and I will be playing a magic-using character who uses knives and whips. So basically you're going for an uh, agile character who might have some spells up her sleeve. Yeah, agile, I guess, in just in the sense of uh, attack speed and whatnot. Uh, I, I don't think that equipment weight is a thing in this game. Fair enough. I mean, just to get up front, of course, this game has a lot of similarities to Dark Souls, so um, we'll both likely be comparing it to Dark Souls as the LP goes along, as well as other games. It has uh, a couple of other notable influences as well. Yeah, but it's not like you can really see a lot of those on the character select screen, aside from possibly Gaia Online. Uh, yeah, the uh, the visuals of this game aren't really my thing. They're not objectively bad, I just am turned off by the flash animation rigging style of character building. Well, you know, when you're a kickstarted project that's going for mechanics over anything, you can't hire an artist. Well, I mean, and not just that, but in a game where you're going to be showing equipment, it really does make sense to use that because it's easy to customize uh, parts and swap them out. Also true. Probably the reason why, for instance, the only difference between male and female characters in this game is the shape of their eyes and mouth. Uh, female characters have identical torso models to male characters. And uh, as we saw a few seconds ago, you can also give them beards, should you choose. Dwarf roleplay. Erotic salt and sanctuary servers. Eye color is pretty hard to see in the regular game. I picked yellow just because. Here we're picking... Uh, ethnicity, I guess, which is really nothing but skin tone, except for a couple like Jindarine that we see there, which are very clearly non-human species. Uh, it's got a pretty decent selection of skin tones. There's some kind of weird ghost person there in Tristan, and there's a frog person in Gulchmeyer, or lizard, or something. Summit green without fangs. Yeah. We'll be going with old white bread coast rock. <laughs> yeah. That's a very strange thing I've always found about the Soul series and things that took some stylings from them is that you have a whole world's worth of ethnicities sketched out on paper that never come to anything. Yeah, and that's definitely something that I think we're going to be seeing here. Um, I I'll put right out in front that this is, uh, while this section of the Let's Play and probably the next one are not blind, everything after that will be. Uh, I've only played a very little bit of this game, but I've seen no evidence that anything that we saw in the character creation screen is going to be relevant in any way other than aesthetically. Don't worry about blind, on the other hand, I'm going to actually be doing a little bit of research before each recording for assistance. Cool. This is a short little intro section. I'm having none of it in this playthrough because it's the third time I've been through it, and honestly, there's not a lot to see in it. Well, we're also not going to get very much interaction out of this aside from one scene upcoming, but right now all you can do is hit things and be stabbed. Pretty much. I could cast skell, er, spells if I chose, but the starting spell for sorcerers isn't that great. More on that later as it comes up. Yeah. Here I am showing off one mechanic. This game 
similar to Dark Souls 2 and 3, allows you to perform a repost attack against an enemy whom you have guard broken. And it seemed quite brutal. I believe it just killed one man by going straight through the one in front of him. There seems to be, with the longer we weapons, a certain degree of splash through damage, but it also seems to be fickle. I'm not positive what the mechanics are there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm jumping around here to give the player a glimpse of what's up on the deck ahead of us. It's big. And uh, also, I'm assuming that not the person in the hood, but the person who's tied up in the chair is the princess, uh, mentioned in the earlier text crawl that uh, we didn't bother to read because it's not very interesting. It's alright. Princess, horrible beasties, pirates, that's pretty much how a Dark Souls begins. Yeah. I'm in pretty bad shape here in terms of health, but this is the starting boss, so he should be pretty easy, I think. He's got a really simple attack pattern. He just kind of walks forward and slams the deck, and you can see that he's a Kakuhi figure. I'm just kidding. Actually, this is a guaranteed boss battle. However, it changes everything to a much more aesthetically pleasing white for loading screens. Salt. That's that's a theme of this game. There's a lot of white in this game. To be fair, at least it does give it a unique style with that as the default color. Yeah, I... I, <clears throat> I guess I should say that the aesthetics of this game don't appeal to me on the level of the sprite style and the animation style. The actual color choices and whatnot are for being washed out tones pretty well done, and there's actually some very good light shading going on here. Mm-hmm. Bloom used in a subtle fashion. Yeah. Also something Dark Souls does well. True. Here we're actually making a choice that's going to have some effect on gameplay, although not a lot, and I believe it's reversible later on. This game's equivalent of bonfires, our save points and havens are called sanctuaries, and uh, we are about to choose what our uh, religion, I guess, is. I, I think they call them faith in this game. Uh, so there are three faiths that we can choose from at the start, and when we choose one, I choose Goddess of Light here because I like the description, not for any other reason. Um, when we choose it, we'll be given an item that we can use to assign an empty sanctuary to that faith. Some sanctuaries that we run into later will be pre-assigned, but we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. There are some mechanical differences that we can discuss later as well, but they're pretty minor. And in the meantime, we'll just... See some gentlemen talk about the fact that you've landed on the island from the new Tomb Raider reboot. <laughs> Come on, we're looking for a princess, nobody ever leaves. Bizarre jungle fates. These bottles on the ground are this game's equivalent of, uh soapstone messages from Dark Souls. We'll be getting an item a little bit later on that lets us place them. It's not that dissimilar. Notice that that dodge roll takes a lot of endurance. Half of my bar. Also, at this point, we should probably note that you have changed the default controls to be more Souls-like, as I have heard they are not amazing. They're much more set up like a God of War-style combat system, uh, with, um, yeah, on, on an Xbox controller, which I used here, default for light attack is X, and default for heavy attack is Y, which I think is straight out of God of War and a lot of its, um, similar games. Oh yeah, that does not sound pleasant to use. I mean, it's perfectly fine in games, you know, like that. I just, I found it a little bit weird in, uh, 
in this. I, I was really in Souls mode when I played it. I'm looking at item descriptions here. As we can see, the developers liked to use um, non-English words for clothing. Generally Eastern European from what research I could find. Eastern European and apparently Northern Asian type stuff, yeah. And it appears to be fairly consistent, which is another element of theming that uh, is subtle. But interesting, I don't really know of an awful lot of games that have copied it. The only ones I can think of are Eastern European developed. Like, I might yeah. say... Uh, the Witcher. I was going to say The Witcher or Pathologic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember hearing about that, but I don't remember anything about it. Uh, descriptions in this game overall are well-written, but not terribly evocative. Also, some of them are needlessly verbose, which is going to make a few things we see later in the video much, much more pleasant. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it is uh, what you would get if you told a competent writer to write some suggestive fantasy material without giving them a lot of other information. I do like the way the display allows you to see things in terms of percentages or raw numbers. That's handy. Yeah, you click the left stick on an Xbox controller to do that, and uh, it's, it's actually a neat touch. Here's our empty sanctuary, and we will be claiming it. I like the jazz hands gesture we do there. It does look a little fussy. Or maybe a little Chris angel -y. Mind freak, and statues begin spraying. This is the skill tree that we're looking at. It's an essential element of leveling up in the game, and it's a major divergence from the Dark Souls series, where leveling up simply allows you to allocate a stat point. Uh, in this game, we have a skill tree that is not unlike Final Fantasy X or uh, the more recent Path of Exile game. And I find it shares more similarities with Path of Exile, given that you can repeat things on certain nodes. Specifically the stat increase ones. We can't level up right now. I don't have enough salt, and... Uh, Salt is located at the bottom left of our HUD there. It's the white triangle number, and we can see a stack of coins directly above that, which indicates another divergence from Dark Souls in that there are two forms of currency. What should also be noted is that our starting class uh, as a mage has put us in a way that we are going to have to work harder for some stats. Correct. Uh... The two golden things there are our starting skills, I guess, and we can only take things that are adjacent to them, so kind of like Final Fantasy X or, I assume, Path of Exile, our starting class is going to inform our earlier decisions for much longer than it does in Dark Souls. And Which is unlike fine. those other titles, well, maybe not unlike Path of Exile. But there is a hard level cap in this game, which means that you will not be covering the whole tree. That's enough reading bottles. <laughs> they did a pretty good job of making it difficult to create naughty messages, but it's never impossible. It's true. Human creativity will not be stifled. Unless you make the game completely useless in conveying the message. Yeah. Uh, these enemies are our starting enemies. They are called, I think, Drowned Walkers. A lot of things on this island seem very drowned, as we'll see once we start picking up certain items. Which makes sense, I guess, since the feeling is everyone is ending up on this island after a shipwreck. Next session, we'll be meeting a couple more, um interesting NPCs, one of whom is going to open up some questions as to what the nature of this island really is. <laughs> but for right now, all we know is that we're stranded on an island, where there are a lot of zombies. 
Yeah, and there appears to be some slight respawning of things in a room, but only to a limited point. Yeah, they uh, they respawn the same way every time, so it's either because of technical limitations to the number of active enemies that can be on the screen, or else it's just a pacing consideration to keep players from getting swarmed. Which is interesting given some of the encounter design, we'll see. Yeah, which isn't bad. No, I just felt it mentioned mer uh, merited mentioning. You know, the other way I said that. Uh, we can talk more about that tombstone that I just smashed when we get to one we can actually see. This enemy is a little tougher. Um, I think that's a drowned berserker. And I just picked up a few red shards there. I picked up a couple earlier. Red shards are weak healing items that do not, uh, that don't respawn at sanctuary points, but also, you know, we can use more of them. So they're kind of like the healing, uh, what, what were they called? The, um, life gems from Dark Souls 2, hmm. in that regard. It should also be pointed out that our first level spell is not direct damage, but in fact a burn over time, which is why it does not make sense to use on groups. But large bosses, however... As we'll see in a minute, uh, it's, it's got some value against them. Uh, also, it should be noted that time effects in this game stack, so if I shoot the same enemy multiple times with a fireball, the rate of damage will increase markedly. We won't be seeing it this playthrough, but that also applies to damage effects on us, which means that when we get into areas with a lot of poison enemies, we can get into trouble really fast. And doubtless will. <laughs> so are there hidden passages that are not marked by light, like the ones that we see here to enter a building? There are, and we'll be okay. uh, opening a couple of them later. Gotcha. I know you're hugging the wall earlier, really, that's why I wondered. Mm, yeah, it's, uh, again, like Dark Souls 2, you, you open up a secret passage by pressing the action key against it, which in my control scheme is left trigger. So anytime you see the left trigger icon popping up, it is prompting me to do an action. Gotcha. Which is always contextual. Whether it's picking up an object or doing a repost on an enemy. Fair enough. So it's just a button prompt, but it wasn't. It will leave you to figure out what it is. Uh, we may as well take this opportunity to take a look at my meters at the top, where uh, we can see that my max HP and stamina have begun to cap. The stamina is due to spellcasting, lowering your max stamina, and uh, you've go with the HP, sorry. Oh, yeah, the HP caps when you take damage, uh, presumably to place a hard limit on survivability even if you carry a whole bunch of healing items. And the two can be restored when you reach a sanctuary, but in the gameplay session, that's when you're really going to feel those. Right. Uh, also, there are items uh, that we will be getting later on that will heal our uh, that will heal our stamina bar back up, and there are also spells, specifically the cleric healing spells, that will recover the HP erosion, which is a built-in advantage to cleric spells, something that actually most games don't have. So, props. A legit reason to be a cleric. Yeah. The class design seems very well done in this, given that everything is designed around, in part, locking you out of a specific tree to some degree. Mm-hmm. At the very least, as far as uh, spellcasting goes, the, the actual fighting... I don't know, because my first build was the hunter class that we saw earlier, with a whip and a crossbow, and... It wasn't bad, but I don't know what the specific attraction is as opposed to, say, a knight. And most people that I have talked to about this game have said that by far the easiest way to play 
is to start as a knight and just pick the biggest weapon you can equip. This right here is a, um, sort of like a half sanctuary. We can't do any leveling up or anything at it, but it will heal us, respawn enemies, and restore our items. The Water of Blessing that I have highlighted up there right now is the healing item associated with the faith that I picked, and this door is locked. Uh, it should be mentioned that the different faiths will allow for some small changes in items. The Water of Blessing, for example, heals less than other choices, but will give you damage reduction shortly after taking it. Which is pretty helpful for a squishy mage. I think. I, I would think that being able to take less damage helps. Defense boost. The, uh... The bottle in this game, unlike the soapstone in Dark Souls, uh, does not restrict your grammar. You can choose any available words in any order that you like, as far as I know, to a certain length. And, uh, yeah, so the only restriction is on your lexicon. We're seeing some suggestive words here, like brand. Kraken. I don't know why we'd ever need one of those. Mm. Unimaginable. It's Jester. I must have been thinking of Devil May Cry 3 when I wrote that or something. That's alright, I just stopped myself about two seconds before doing a Krusty the Clown impression. We can see right there that the launching attack that I've been doing does not launch that big wolf. Uh, so some enemies have a degree of inertia. Which is an interesting touch. In a game that's a little bit more kinetic than, uh, than some of its inspirations. That tombstone I broke there is left behind by another player's death. And uh, apparently the tombstone that you get is based on your faith. So keep an eye out for all three. And here's our first boss. I know nothing about him. He's soggy. I guess. Probably be less soggy if he took off that fur coat he's wearing. Well, you know, it's the catch-22 of being on a giant seaside island. Hmm. Uh, I'm doing a lot of darting and rolling around. I did a bit of spell casting at the beginning, but realized it would be better to save for when he enters into the later phases and gets a bit more dangerous. Uh, I didn't die to him this run, but I died to him a number of times in my first run, because as you can see, he deals a fair chunk of damage with a hit. He also speeds up slightly, but he's very telegraphed, and he is your first real boss. Yeah. Once you recognize the sort of uh, follow-up patterns that he does, there's not a lot to him. And uh, in just a second, I'll uh, I'll drop a train on him. In the form of a whole bunch of fire. But if you watch, you notice how the numbers just rise from single to double to thirties. So on the larger bosses, that flame spell that we start with is actually fairly useful, even if it's not that great in uh, Luke fights. We get a nice chunk of change. The Sodden Knight's Ashes, I think it said? Yes. Is that what it said? And I have no idea what those are for. It says they can be traded to leaders or used in the game's crafting system, but I haven't really done much with either of those yet. Uh, and we got a key. Well, you know. And we met a locked door just a little while ago, so guess where we're going? I I'm gonna guess the one locked door we've seen so far in the video. That would be a good guess, but I think actually what I did was go back to the sanctuary to um, do some other stuff first. Hmm. Oh yeah, and I'm about to demonstrate here that uh, the game does have a feature that is not normally welcome in a platformer, fall damage. 
But, you know, it makes sense if designed around it. However, I can see it being irritating when you're trying to traverse older areas. There are a few movement mechanics in this game with regard to jumping around or being knocked by enemies that can lead to some deaths that feel a little cheap. But it's not egregious. It's just a little bit irritating when you have as much on the line as you sometimes do in these games. Here I'm getting, I think, three levels. And one major difference uh, between this game and the Souls games is leveling up on its own does nothing. What leveling does is give us items called Black Pearls, which we use to unlock spaces on the skill tree. The majority of the spaces are just simple stat up uh, tokens, which will increase a stat by one. We can see the result where the green number is on the left. And the vast majority of the stats that are available to us on our side of the tree are magic. Makes sense. We took Class 2 Magic User despite its high cost here because pretty soon we'll be getting a Class 2 spell that's a significant upgrade. And that file sleeve is the item that we will be getting which restores our spellcasting use. Naturally a high priority for a spellcasting class. I have to admit, I do like the design of this tree and that there is some crossover between certain trees. So you can skip to the middle of another adjacent class. Absolutely, it makes it um, a lot more viable to build in one direction and then shift your focus than it, than it would be if you had to start at the beginning. That's a good point. Uh, these are items that we can offer to attract merchants and other helpful NPCs to our sanctuary, but there's a better sanctuary not far from here that we'll be going to where I'll use them instead. Uh, that's another advantage, I think, of taking the goddess as your starting faith, is that you get a customizable sanctuary a little bit later in the game, so you don't have to go all the way to the beginning. Um, you can level up and heal at, at a sanctuary that is not aligned with your faith, but you cannot customize it. Makes sense. What you what you take is what you get. Um, it may be possible to change your faith halfway through the game. Actually, I know it is, because I made it to a sanctuary that's a fourth faith. Um, hmm. I, I think. Yeah, I made it to a sanctuary that is a fourth faith uh, in a different run, um, where I could change to it. But uh, I, I haven't yet had an opportunity to change to either of the starting three yet. Presumably. I mean, I just say that as an evocative a name as the Festering Banquet is, they really don't do much with that thing. Uh, I mean, yeah, I it, it just looks like a mausoleum. Yeah. So I guess they're gnawing on them bones. You know, it makes sense. This does look a bit like a feast hall other than the fact that it's five stories tall, but... It's... It's kind of got a Skyrim, uh, what were those places called in Skyrim, the crypts? I, I can't remember now. It looks a little bit like I them. I could not bloody well tell you. Yeah, here's our first, um, major NPC. I, he doesn't have a lot to say that's interesting or cogent, but I get the impression that we'll probably be seeing him again. Yeah, and that sounds like an open-ended question we won't have to revisit at all. Mm. He's talking some Chesterton at us. <laughs> and just uh, giving us some hints about things. Uh, evidently there's a Jester NPC. I didn't know about that when I wrote that message earlier. Um, but... Uh, presumably we'll be meeting him at some point and he'll be a source of information. And as you can see there, we just found a black pearl, so apparently those exist as in-universe items that we can find as rewards for exploration. Which is interesting. I don't know if using a black pearl that you don't level up for counts as an increase in your level or not. Uh, 
It does not. If it doesn't, then if there's a hard level cap, that actually makes them a really important item for min-maxing. It's true, especially if you can carry things over on New Game Plus. I presume there's one of those in this. Couldn't say. I'd be mildly surprised if there weren't, but uh, I haven't looked it up. Back here, if you look closely, you can see a sort of obelisk-like structure in the background. Uh, we'll be able to interact with those later, I think, using an item or something called a brand, but I don't know much else. This early on, both of us are somewhat vague on the mechanics for the sense of trying not to spoil one another on the early videos, just so we can be better at explaining things. Here is the second Devara-associated sanctuary, and that NPC there is a cleric, who is a cleric vendor, essentially. Uh, another quick level up, I'm working my way toward the file sleeve first, because being able to heal spellcasting is going to be useful once I get my tier 2 spell, and then I'm going to start working my way toward the center of the tree to get the two potion upgrades that are there. That will increase the number of blessed waters that I get. I didn't think I was going to talk to her at first, but I decided to just so I could show off what she does. Um, she says uninteresting Sunday school things and uh, sells us cleric magic that we can't use. Especially given that it's class 2. Oh yeah. Even if we were to quickly class over, we wouldn't be able to use that right now. No. Uh, and also items, some of which are potentially useful. The blessed page that I passed over there is a temporary weapon buff, and the cleric's kite shield would be useful if I didn't have another shield in mind that we will be getting very shortly. Also note that her prayers, or her items, actually cost gold rather than salt. Uh, yeah, the, the other currency gold is mostly used for purchasing things from NPCs. I say mostly because there might be another use, I don't know. I haven't seen it, but it's not impossible. Uh, salt is used for more than leveling up, which we'll see a little bit later on. Uh, right now, uh, we're seeing what the blacksmith has for sale to begin with. It's uh, some pretty basic equipment. I notice also there are class zero items, which I assume anyone can use. Anyone can use a class zero item of any type. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are any Class Zero magics, though. If there are, I, I haven't seen them. Little uh, semi-hidden area up here. Um, as we can see, there's another obelisk, so I'm not going to be able to proceed in that direction, but if I drop down here, I can grab that item that we saw earlier, which isn't anything big. It's a mace and a bag of salt, which is like the minor soul items in Dark Souls games, I can just use it to grab some extra salt. And they won't be lost if you die. Which is handy. Should I need to, say, stock up on items immediately after dying, although I'm not really worried about that in this run. We should be good. I'm using this pitchfork here not really because it's a great weapon or because I'm going to be using spears, but because it's kind of handy for this little grinding spot right here. Uh, a bunch of respawning enemies appear, and you can kill them, and it nets you about 300 salt and a little chunk of change. Also, they drop some items which are fairly useful for this area of the game, though I didn't get any this time. I'm showing off the quick attack as well as the heavy attack. That jumping lunge I was doing is the spear heavy attack. It hits twice if you do it close up. It's handy, and the range on those is not just cosmetic, as you were going through two to three minutes at a time. Spears are excellent for crowd control in this game. They are the equivalent of the big, long, sideways, swingy swords in the Dark Souls games. They are very much for crowd control. Uh, the mace has a chargeable strong attack, uh, which a lot of weapons don't. Mm -hmm. 
as we can see, I, I was attempting to charge the spear strong attack there, and it did not work. Uh, I'm going to test out the mace in a second. Uh, I forgot that I had to sit at the sanctuary to respawn the enemies. <laughs> well, now we've seen that in demonstration. I was grinding here not so much because I wanted the experience, but because these enemies will drop a couple of items that I was going to purchase in a minute. Uh, as we can see, that charged up attack is devastatingly powerful. Um, it killed the enemy behind the first one I hit in one strike and broke the guard of the other after a second. But I got in a little over my head here, and that was that. I won't be using maces again in this run. As we see, dying uh, loses all of your salt as well as roughly a tenth of your gold. Ha. So, it's a significant loss. We can go get our salt back. The gold is gone forever. Um, I think I'm, I just went ahead and purchased the equipment that I'm going to be using for combat from now on, which is going to be, uh, not going to be using crossbows. They're, they're essentially magic if you don't want to be a spellcaster. Like, uh, like catalysts, they go in the offhand and are ranged. Um, as we can see, this dagger here is way faster than the sword that I was using earlier. But I was taking no chances getting my salt back from this guy that took it from me. He's the one glowing white. Yeah, this game uses the Bloodborne system of recovering your lost experience. Uh, if an enemy kills you, it takes it from you and you have to kill that enemy to get it back. Uh, whereas if you die to a fall or to some other inanimate source, it turns into a giant bat that you have to kill to get it back. Very Castlevania. Yeah. There's a bit of Castlevania influence to be seen here. I'm using up my salt bags here because I wanted to speed up my leveling process a little bit. That blacksmith is remarkably calm about things constantly exploding in his face. <laughs> You'd think he'd have to sneeze after a minute. Yeah, maybe it's just so dry in here he doesn't feel it. Leveling up a couple more times, and I believe that's going to get me another potion, and more healing is always welcome. Uh, oh no, 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 this is going to get me the file, and then I believe I went back and started working my way toward the potion. We know where we are at the end of the video, just not in the middle. Hmm. <laughs> We're getting there. I'm going to be making one more run out to uh, to an area below where we were at the start uh, to grab a couple of things that are going to be very useful to us. Including a shield, apparently, which is not something you usually see with a mage. And I will never be equipping more than a class zero shield, probably in this run, because the shield skills are all the way on the other side of the skill tree. And of course, it takes up my catalyst slot, so I'm never going to be at my combat strongest when I'm using it anyway. The shield is mainly going to be for traversal, dealing with enemies that are too weak to use spells against. Makes sense. Worth mentioning that in this game, unlike in the Soul Kings, strike damage and slash damage have separate uh, ratings for different shields. So a shield might block 100% of slashing, but not 100% of strike. The heater shield that I've got is a pretty well-rounded one. Early on that makes sense. This uh, sing-songy fellow here is a beggar who stowed away on a ship which wrecked and washed up here, and uh, it seems to have traumatized the poor fellow a little bit. Well, you know, you always need one character who's 
very repetitive. I have to say, the posture that your character takes in this game when they're talking to an NPC where they periodically cross their arms, combined with the random eye twitching thing, makes them look very impatient and sarcastic when dealing with NPCs. Look, I'm not going to talk. I know how I deal with NPCs in any game. Rydia is having none of this. Come on, you got nothing? You got nothing good? Alright, screw you. Next video, I'll be looking at those items down there that had X's on them. I just forgot to this time. But those are the boss armor uh, from the Sodden Knight whom we just killed. This beggar's gimmick is that he goes behind us and uh, takes armor from bosses that we kill. Maybe NPCs too, I'm not sure. No, I don't think you can attack NPCs in this game. Uh, torches are items that you find, they work kind of like Dark Souls 2 in that they're limited use and they stack. That weird scythe ghost enemy there is something I'm taking very seriously because those holes that I'm jumping over will kill me if I fall into them. Yeah, it seems like a thing you're going to want to be careful of. I died there in earlier runs, and it was very irritating. Yeah, that would do it. Uh, we'll be going down this way instead. And Ready once down we... the darkest hole? Why, I never. <laughs> Not in a game like this. Uh, we'll be looking into our first uh, hidden area here. It's against this wall here. When I press the action button, a section slides away and reveals a hidden passageway to a tiny little chamber where we find a kismet stone. I don't know if that's a... it's probably a real word. Um, kismet is a real word, yes. Yeah, I, I think I've heard it before, but I don't know what it means. This is the, uh, the covetous gold serpent's ring from Dark Souls. It increases item drop rates. The effects ring that I took earlier, the um, ring of salt or whatever it was called, that is a covetous silver serpent ring, which increases the amount of salt gained from enemies, which is, essentially means that we're going to be leveling a little bit quicker as long as we wear it. Never something to turn your nose up at. There's another hidden passage here, which is a little bit mean, in my opinion, because it contains some really essential mage equipment including that tier 2 spell that I just found, which we will be equipping straight away, because it's a huge upgrade. Uh, as well as, after a tricky encounter at the bottom of this cave that we might have fallen into, uh, an even more essential item. Incidentally, Kismet would be fate, by the way. Ah. Makes sense. He just did 64 damage to me with a hit, which is, um, a lot. This, uh, crustacean centaur pyramid head fell out. I've switched over to using my spells here, and as you can see, the damage on this is constant. Considerable compared to the earlier spell we were using. Made short work of him. The lightning bolt spell fires two lightning bolts, which deal damage separately even to the same enemy, and also pierce enemies. So they are amazing for both doing large amounts of damage quickly and for crowd control. The only disadvantage is that it's a little bit more expensive than the fireball, so as you can see, I'm down to just about half endurance here, which is going to make combat a little bit more trying. Is there anything that will increase an endurance or health meter as we go on? Just stat points? Stat points. Um, actually, I believe there is a ring that I will be getting at some point that increases endurance. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, there's also a ring that increases the white bar below the endurance meter, which is the maximum amount that my endurance meter can be reduced before I can't cast anymore. So if I want hmm. to be an extreme caster, I can reduce myself to a third endurance. Dang. Yeah, that seems ballsy.
as long as I'm good about using uh, using my file, uh, which is in this case with my faith is called the cloth of blessing, uh, I should be okay. Ah, so the files change from faction to faction too. Yes. Interesting. I think so. I will have to look that up later. They do, yes, actually, I know they do. Uh, from when I switched, uh, switched my faith in my first run. Hmm. I don't know if there are still mechanical differences. There might be or there might not be. Um, if there were, I would guess that probably the Cloth of Blessing is a little bit more geared toward mages. Well, I'll add that to the list of things to take a look at. Okay. Make one last trip over this way, uh, stopping by to make a quick level up run. I believe this is the last I'll be leveling up this video. No, I think I do it once more. Um, but I will be getting my initial potion upgrade, which will increase the amount of water of blessing I get from 3 to 4. Those cannot be stacked. You can only take them once. Well, it makes sense not everything would stack, just to prevent you from taking, uh, you know, class 2 magic over and over. Yeah. I wonder if it's a viable thing to specifically take level ups with the end of giving yourself a larger amount of healing items. I'm sure anything is viable with the skill. That's sort of the issue with the genre. Yeah, yeah, you can make anything work if you really, really want to. How stubborn do you want to be about playing this? Yeah. In my case, not that stubborn. I like this game, but uh, I doubt that I'll ever be power playing it. Gotcha. Uh, as we can see, the lightning bolt is devastating on these enemies. Awesome. If, they, if they're not blocking and both bolts hit them, it is a one-shot, and it can take multiple enemies out at a time. And there, we can see that spells can be integrated into combos. That backstep is incredibly handy, if not lethal. It is, uh, it is nice. It's a great way of getting out of danger while remaining on the offensive. And uh, this time I felt bold enough to try and take on this area the rest of the way. So once I clear out these enemies, I'll be moving further to the right. Progress. It's either that or egress. You know, whatever works sometimes. Uh, actually, I lied because we got a lock of hair. We saw that earlier, the beggar was selling them, but what these are are this game's type knight. Uh, the blacksmith requires a lock of hair, or uh, later on there are different items that are for higher level enhancements, but uh, he will take an item as well as some salt in order to upgrade a weapon or a piece of armor. We'll be upgrading our magic because we're a magic user. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's the only NPC interaction I've found so far that requires salt. There's probably more. I can't imagine they have that whole thing just for one mechanic. It sort of makes sense because, you know, equipment is an aspect of character growth. Uh... On the other hand, I don't believe there's enemy despawners, so it's not like you really need to make a choice if you're willing to put the time in. Uh, yeah, I got in a bit over my head there, so I uh, ran back and did some healing real quick, and then back into the fray. Hey, if it works. Some enemies, if they uh, if they take enough damage quickly enough, they go into a kneeling posture. Uh, from which you can stomp them. And these large enemies, if both bolts of that lightning bolt hits them, it is an instant stun. Fantastic. That does seem incredibly potent and convenient. And uh, they left a couple of drops with some equipment that we won't be using because it's heavy and uh, we don't have the class for it. 
but uh, we see more of the Eastern European clothing names. Ushanka. And Ushanka is the iconic Vladimir Lenin hat. So big, furry, tall, etc. Mm-hmm. And with the uh, with the flaps on it that can be folded down over the ears. And Portianki is probably a word for pants or boots. I never looked it up. It's boots. The uh, the acolytes um, contours that we are wearing is uh, you said it was a was it? It's a uh, it's an older winter coat. Yeah, and uh, what what nationality? What language was that from again? Was it? Uh, Polish or uh, Polish Lithuanian. Polish Lithuanian. Okay, yeah. If I remember correctly, it was a PL. I like our green hair, so I'm not going to be wearing uh, headgear unless I find some that I like the look of, and I haven't found any yet. Is this a very gear-driven game in terms of protection? I don't know. I, armor can be leveled up, I think. Okay. Um, so probably you can make anything viable if you're willing to deal with it. And actually, I said equipment weight wasn't a thing, but it is. Equip weight is a thing. I just don't know if it affects your movement until you get overburdened. Mm -hmm. So it may just be a hard limit on how much you can wear, I'm not sure. I, uh, I don't have the class ability to equip enough to overburden me. <laughs> so I've never done it. Oh, interesting. That has to be a, a specific ability. Also, I like how nobody even tries to make uh, chain mail more than, yeah, it's a hat. It's made of chains. <laughs> Links. It's very brief among the item descriptions, and that's unexpected. Keep it nice and simple. It's heavy armor, so we won't be using it some flame arrows that we probably also won't be using, although, uh, unlike most ranged weapons, bows are equipped in the weapon hand, so you use them instead of a melee weapon. Hmm. Another locked door, and one for which I haven't yet found the key in any run. And, uh, yep, like that guy said, this is the end of the road for us for now. Well, we'll find a way around. He's giving us a hint for where to go, although... Uh, to be quite honest, I haven't gotten to the area past this yet, so I don't know the particulars. We'll figure it out. We see another one of those obelisks there, so doubtless it's going to involve getting a brand of some sort. Uh, incidentally, there is... I haven't shown it, but there is an equip slot for brands, or... Not an equip slot, but an inventory category for brands. Hmm. And there's a nice little hidden area up here with a little bit of stuff, including a very useful stone guide, um, who will be our form of fast travel. And I'm very lucky I didn't die here. <laughs> yeah, holy crap, that was a sliver. Uh, yep, fall damage stacks up very quickly, just like in any game with fall damage. True. A little bit more careful this time. One of the reasons I'm not a huge fan of this graphical style is that it makes precise platforming a little bit difficult. Um, that was some cleric gear that we got there. Light vessels are grenades, as far as I can tell. I haven't used any yet. Um, hmm. But in the description it says you hawk them at enemies and it, they blow up in whole light. And the mending thing that we got was a, a tier 2 um, cleric spell. Wait, wait, wait. You're telling me this game has holy hand grenades? Yes. Yes, I am. Wow. Didn't see our, that coming. Our magic has increased quite a bit here. Uh, we're already at 15. Um, I think in my earlier mage run I had gotten it up to 20. Uh, and that was before I had leveled up anything other than dexterity, so... Our stats are not very balanced, and uh, that's also the end of this uh, this session. We'll be back. Next session, we'll be exploring the Village of Smiles. Thank you for joining me. Glad to be here. And thank you for watching. See you around, folks.